Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining. I'm just getting myself set up here, making sure that I can see all of your wonderful information and chat box. Um, if you can see and hear me clearly, go ahead and drop me a note in the chat box. And also just let me know where you're joining me from. We're just going to give people um, a little bit more time to join here, but I would love to see where you are from and who's here. Hi, Jennifer from Arizona. Wonderful. Indiana. What's up? Central, Central time. Spokane over there in the Pacific area. Thank you for joining us. Just give people just a minute more. Kentucky and Oregon, you guys are all over the place today. This is so excited. Illinois, fantastic. Thank you for joining me. I'm so ramped up to talk about this topic um, and I can't wait to share with you why. So you're gonna feel a lot of energy from me today. Um, this is something that I'm super passionate about. And so I'm just gonna dive right into it. If you've never used Zoom before, um, a lot of you I know we're using this in the workplace now, so we're getting acquainted with it. But just want to make sure that one, you know where the chat box is, and two, I do have the Q&A open. I will have the chat box open, so don't feel like you have to put your questions in the Q&A. But if you feel like you don't want to put it and chat out to everyone, you can submit it to the Q&A and I'll see it and I'll be able to answer it along the way. All right? So we are here to talk about mastering communication in the digital workplace. Um, again, like I said, I'm super passionate about this with my background as an EA and also as a director of communications. This is something I'm super passionate about. So we're going to dive right in. Hope you guys are ready, ready to take notes. Don't worry about capturing everything. You will have access to the replay when we're done. All right. It helps if I click on the screen. There we go. All right. So if you joined me at my previous webinar, you know that remote connections are really important, not only right now, but just as the way our workspaces are evolving. We have to relearn how to engage with other people. And we have to learn how to be human in a digital world. And it's really tricky. Anyone who's ever had a text message, chat, or email misunderstood, <laughs> um, misread, hey, your tone sucks, whatever that is, knows what I'm talking about. So we have to relearn how to engage with people because you can't read body language 100% of the time. The way people are behind a camera is not the way that they actually intend to be. So we're going to learn how to clean all of this up. And I'm going to make sure that when you communicate with people, you are as understood as humanly possible. You are doing your best to connect with other people and you're teaching them how to communicate with you. As I start all of my webinars, all of my teachings, if you've ever followed me on social media, you know that you do not have to be a leader to be a leader. I'm a big proponent of lead by example. It is something that I have harnessed in my career and I love seeing it happen across organizations because that is how, one, how you get noticed, um, but two, how you take control of your life. If you act like a leader, you will become a leader, whether that means a leader by title, a leader by job role, whether you're starting your own business or just how you feel about yourself. So if you want to have people up their skill level, you have to show them how to do that. So thank you for being here. You're already being a leader just by being here with me. If we have not met before, my name is Jen. I am bursting with energy. Um, yes, my name is Jennifer Lawrence. That is my legal name. Makes it awfully hard to buy website domains and get social media handles. Um, I am a product system, productivity and systems expert, and I primarily work with business owners, leaders, and teams to clean up all of their time and energy leaks so that they are working as efficiently as possible. This is not so that they can cram more work into their workday, but so that their work feels more fulfilling. So when they leave their work, it's not draining and sucking the life out of them. Because I truly believe that we work to live, we don't live to work. And so I want you to work the best way you can so you can have the best life you can. I come from a background of 15 years of administrative and project management experience. I started off as a clerical in a podiatry office, worked my way all the way up to senior executive assistant, chief of staff, and eventually I was the director of communications for a global company. And that's the skill set I'm going to push in your direction today. I'm also wildly enthusiastic about not only professional development, but also personal development. Um, if you follow me on Instagram, you know I'm always sharing books that I love to read, podcasts I like. And so if you're in that world, go ahead and give me a follow. All of my information will be at the end. And I love 
Disney. So if anybody else is a huge Disney fan, you can give me like a little high five or some love in the chat box. But if you ever just want to chat Disney, you let me know. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about mastering communications. So like I said, we, this is super, super important, not just now. What you're going to learn today is not only going to help you in our current environment, um, being that everyone is working remotely and there's all sorts of tools being used and communication techniques are flying all over the place and we're kind of fumbling, not really knowing what to do. The skill sets you're going to learn today are going to help you for the duration of your life as we transition into this mostly digital world that we work in. So don't think that this is just something that you are going to use in this phase that we're in. And as we finish this up, if you've learned something, please share this with your colleagues, your friends. Again, it will be free. Everyone will get the replay. I just want everyone to learn how to communicate well together. So I've broken this down into four areas. We're gonna talk about leveraging the right tools and implementing them the right way. We're gonna talk about how to do thoughtful communication. I'm going to give you the breakdown of what makes an effective email so that you get the right answer that you need the first time and you don't have to do the back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And then finally, we're going to touch on some effective virtual meetings. Um, and so that way we're not spinning our wheels and having 800 meetings and things are getting out of control. And you've all seen the memes of, you know, can you hear me? It's like a conference call from hell. So we're going to talk about how to do this all successfully. First, let's talk about tools. Here's what I first wanna talk about, is when we find a need for something, we usually jump from, I need to hear solution. We don't think about, I need to do this with these people. What is the solution? We usually go after the biggest, shiniest thing, whatever people tell us we need to use. And so we just jump on the bandwagon, just take all the tools and we hope that they land and everything works the way we need it to work. So instead, I want you to think thoughtfully of the right tools to communicate with the people you need to communicate to. So when it comes to messaging, a lot of people are using Google Hangouts. They use Slack, which is also a different sort of project management collaboration tool, which we'll touch on. Um, they use Office Communicator, they're using um, Facebook chat, WeChat, whatever it is that you're using. Just make sure one, any tool that you're going to implement qualifies under your security IT protocol. So if you're a business owner, that's whatever makes you feel most secure. If you are in a traditional work environment, that means you need to pass this through your IT company because cybersecurity is number one concern when it comes to digital tools. So when it comes to messaging though, make sure you're using a messaging system that is reliable that every, most people have immediate access to already. Don't go find something new because it sounds good because it's new. If most of your team members already have Google accounts and they're already using Google chat and your IT department's cool with that, just get everybody on Google chat. Like don't go and find some other different tool. Implementing a share drive. Now most share drives function the same way. So find the share drive that works with your company, whether it's you know, Teams, Dropbox, um, Box, Google Drive, what have you. You're also going to need some form of screen share tools, much like Zoom, um, Google Hangouts, any virtual video communication tool is going to allow you to screen share. One tool that a lot of people don't know about or don't use is a tool called Loom. That's L-O-O-M, so Zoom with an L. It is a video recording tool for your desktop. And I love this. I use it extensively in my business when people ask me, hey, Jen, how do I do this? Whether it's on a website that I've built for them, whether it's a system I've implemented for them, or just something they want to know that I know how to do. I've even used it to show people how to change their calendar settings in Google. And so what it does is it allows you to actually video capture your desktop, record your voice over or a picture of yourself talking. Um, and it allows you to quickly upload it instantaneously gets loaded into um, a housing warehouse, file share <laughs> warehouse um, and then you can just send the link to somebody to review it is a super quick way to show people how to do something when you can't be face to face this is a great tool to implement it is 
free, I think for 30 days right now, but they are a great tool to look at for a long-term investment. And if you work in um, education or you are a student, I know they're offering it free for the duration of your employment or your schooling. So look into that for your team. That's a great tool to just amp up your communication in a way that feels a little bit more personal. And then you're not trying to type up instructions in an email and put screenshots together, just record a video. Finally, we're going to talk about project management tools because this is a tool where one, it's the most expensive and two, it's the one that gets implemented the fastest without people really understanding what they need. So project management tools, I am talking about what people commonly think of as task management tools. So we're talking about Trello, Asana, Monday.com, Slack, any of those interfaces that allow you to collaborate and document. Um, make sure your team knows how to use it. And also, make sure it's the solution you want for yourself. Most of these tools do exactly the same thing. The interface is just different. The way the tool integrates with different systems is different. So make sure that you're fully understanding the capabilities and what integrates best with your current team needs and the current systems you already have in place. No need to just throw everything up in the air because you heard that Monday is better than Trello or that Slack is the way to go. And also remember that these tools are meant to be supplemental to the work. They're not meant to be additional work. So the next thing I want to talk about is setting expectations around usage, because a lot of times we get these tools and there's so much more work to manage than they are worth. So first, as we mentioned, make sure it's the appropriate tool for what's needed. So make sure you understand your end game and the tool that you're implementing is the right solution for you and your team. The second part is set expectations around the actual usage and response time. So if you have a team that's going to implement Slack, do you expect your team to sit on Slack all day and respond as fast as possible? Or do you expect them to check in at least once every 24 hours, once every 48 hours to get caught up on the news feed, what have you? Do you expect them to use Trello as their to-do list, as well as their collaboration tools so that everything lives in the same space. And also, while we're talking about setting expectations, make sure you're providing the training. So a great example of this is I worked at a company and we implemented Trello very early on in the Trello life cycle. And when we were looking at the tool, we're like, this is great. We're gonna have to train people a lot on this. And then on top of that is, you know, how is this meant to be used? You know, you, you can hand somebody a tool. It's a lot like if you were to open the box from Ikea, you're already frustrated, right? And you see all the tools and there's no instructions. And everything looks kind of like, well, maybe they changed the Allen wrench just a little bit. And maybe they changed just the bolts a bit, but nobody told you. And so you're like, ah, I guess I'll just figure it out. And then people get frustrated because the end result doesn't look the way it's supposed to, or it doesn't work as efficiently as they were told it was going to. So my suggestion is if you implement any tool, whether it's a new messaging system, a new share drive, a new screen share tool, do a quick lunch and learn. Set up a 30 minute, 45 minute, whatever feels good for you, video training, walk through the basic functionalities. Here's how we envision it working for your work. Don't do the, here's the tutorial of how you add in a task and how you assign it to somebody. Talk about it in a way that matters to the audience. So what do I need to know about this tool? How am I expected to use it? And then at the end of it, also provide some sort of resource of best practices. Um, that way, if anybody couldn't attend live or just is hoity-toity about technology or what have you, you are providing all the information possible of what your best practices are. Because giving somebody a tool and not teaching them how they are meant to use it to achieve the work that they need to achieve is not effective in any way. All right, so those are tools. Obviously, I'm very passionate about this. <laughs> so um, the next thing I wanna talk about is thoughtful communication. Most of this you know. Um, I, if you've ever worked in a work environment, you know this, but it is something to remember it at a heightened level in a digital workspace. So first and foremost, take the lead on discussing your communication styles. Um, when I was an executive assistant, I worked in a company and we oversaw a third of the company and I worked for the leader at the top of that. And so I was constantly getting bombarded with chat messages 
emails, phone calls, people walking up to my desk because we worked in an open office environment. And it was overwhelming for me because I was always being communicated with. I had a lot of input happening and it interrupted me all the time. It flustered me because people were putting things in places that were hard for me to remember. And I had to constantly be shifting gears and constantly be all over everything. And it was hard for me and it was unnecessarily hard. So what I did is I put together a best, it was basically a best practices sheet. And I sent it out to the team and said, hey, I would like to serve you as best as possible. Unfortunately, due to my workload and the vast team um, numbers, I need to parse down where the information is coming from. So chat is meant for immediate, simple to answer questions that are not super urgent. So that means if I don't see the chat box and I don't respond right away, that's okay. Emails are for basic communications. Meetings are for in-depth conversations. And phone calls and arriving to my desk expresses a sense of immediate urgency, but please remember that your urgency is not my emergency. And I provided this in a cute little chart and I sent it out to the team. And it was so wildly well received that everybody created their own versions and they hung it at their desks and they sent it out to their team members. Because you have to teach people how to communicate to you and what works well with your work, your, your communication style. Now I can already feel people rolling their eyes and saying that's not reasonable, my manager would be pissed, or that's just not the way our culture works. Totally get it. So the other thing to do is to have conversations one-on-one -on -one with people. And be honest, just say, hey, right now I'm having a really hard time communicating with you. How do you prefer to receive task requests? How do you prefer to receive this information? And don't just get down to what tool to use. Get down to, do they need all the context? Do they need all the background info? Do they want the whole story? Do they want the cliff notes? Do they just want the bullet points? Do they just need to know what your question is? Because they may already know enough to say yes or no. So have that, instigate that, instigate that, <laughs> instigate that conversation with people in a nice way um, so that you can have thoughtful communication going forward and you're being a problem solver rather than just making assumptions. Now that segues beautifully into the next one is to please always assume the best intent. And I, I can't tell you how many times this has been hammered into my head, see it everywhere. You get the memes, you get the, the letters from HR, you know, assume the best intent. Um, the best way to do that too, is to just ask questions afterwards. Um, you can just simply say, Hey, I got a sense of urgency from your email. Can you please help me understand what the deadline is? So rather than somebody, you get an email and you're thinking, oh gosh, they want me to drop everything right now. They don't respect that I have a workload. They don't respect what I have going on. Just ask the question. Because a lot of times people forget to add in these elements that help us make decisions about prioritizing. And so you have to ask them for it. And just accept the fact that that is a fact of life. And that's just the way that people work. And by asking those questions, you're actually going to train and coach people to provide that information to begin with. I've seen it happen across multiple organizations where if I just ask multiple times, what time zone is that in? When do you need this by? I have a bunch of other stuff on my plate. Let me know if you need me to negotiate my time for this. Otherwise I can provide it tomorrow. And inevitably I get emails that say, hey, no rush on this. I don't need it before Friday. Or, oh shoot, I totally forgot to send in the time zone. That's in the Pacific time zone. And so you'll eventually coach people just by asking your questions. You will coach people to also communicate with you the way you want to be communicated with, but also assume the best intent from you, which is great. And the final thing is to actively solicit feedback. Um, this gets lost in the digital world. I'm going to be really honest with you. Um, if you work in a traditional environment, you're constantly picking up on um, EQ around the office and you can get, you know, I don't know how anybody else feels about this, but you can get like vibes from people. Um, so, you know, when you've made somebody mad, right? Like they can storm out of a room, but you know, when somebody clicks end meeting and they can walk away and huff and puff <laughs> and they can rile about you and they'll complain about you to their partner and their friends, and then they'll come back into the next meeting and everything's fine. So you need to actively be soliciting the feedback on how you are communicating with other people. So we all know how this works. Just simply ask people, hey, you know, I've done a few meetings now and I don't know if I'm running them effectively enough. Do you have any pointers for me? 
or I'm really struggling with my inbox. Can you really help me uh, figure out how to prioritize things? Or, you know, I sent this, I'm, get, I'm thinking about sending out this email. Can you just read it over for me, please? And let me know what you think. Does this read okay? Um, and do it with multiple people. Don't pick one person and that be your, your one person. It could be somebody above you. It could be a mentor. It could be a peer. I am a business owner and I have a network of other people who are business owners as well. And I use this with them. And so it just get into the habit of asking for people about how you come across while you are delivering digital communication. And that will serve you in the long run because you also get into the habit of asking people um, in person. The other great side effect of this is that people may turn around the question on you and ask about themselves. And so this will provide an open door trusting a conversation for you to also provide feedback to other people who are struggling or that you're struggling to communicate with. All right. The next section is effective emails. Um, this is one of my favorite things to talk about because with a background in administration, <laughs> my inbox has been flooded and flooded and flooded. And I have seen emails that get flooded into senior leadership inboxes. And I have written a number of emails myself. And we all get frustrated by the number of emails, the incomplete information, the um, information that is hard to decipher, and um, just the sheer lack of consideration in them. And I'm gonna talk about that when I talk about improving your writing skills because you may not think you're being inconsiderate, but you're being inconsiderate by making assumptions. So let's start with improving your writing skills. I'm gonna just go down into some like nitty gritty of just things you can do today to tweak your emails um, that will make them received much better but also make sure that you are getting the answer you need now. One email, you get the answer you need. So first things first, we're gonna start at the top. Stop using the subject line to have your message in it. There's a reason for this, well there's two. One, most people don't read the subject line, which is gonna be so counterintuitive to the next one that I'm going to, uh, <laughs> tip I'm gonna tell you, but one, Nobody reads it. Second of all, most subject lines get cut off by their interfaces. So if I see it pop up on my iPhone and I see an incomplete message, I'm going to go look at the body and I'm going to be like, where's the message? Oh my gosh, it's in the subject. And blah, blah. like it's an email is not a text message. So treat it like a message, give it a subject, give it a thoughtful and useful subject. If you want to get the response that you need, be clear and concise and set expectations with people in the subject. And the reason you're gonna do this is because it's gonna sit in their inbox and they're gonna see that one line. So they may not read that line the first time they open it, but if that's sitting in their inbox, they're gonna see that line over and over and again. And here's how you do it effectively. Tell people what they need to do in the subject line. Start with signature needed, response needed, FYI, important information, whatever it may be that you need, response needed by, and then you're gonna add that by into any of them. So signature needed by, um, response needed by, contract signed by, and add a due date. Because when you have those, those set of characters, that's going to be in every preview of any inbox on any device. So people will see that and be like, oh shoot, that's needed by Thursday. And then do a colon and be super concise about what it is. Company X's contract, um, event on such and such date at such and such time. Be very, 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 very specific and set expectations. When you get into the body of the email, don't skip the greeting. <laughs> Greetings are not lost. Repeat what is needed from the subject line in the first paragraph. A lot of people will say, well, I included that information in the subject line and they just launch right into their message. Again, most people didn't read the subject line. So be as specific as possible. Say below is information, important information regarding our board retreat meeting coming up on Wednesday, April 23rd. I think I'm making updates now. Wednesday, April 23rd at three o'clock PM at the such and such pavilion and include all of that information right away. Don't assume that people know what meeting this is about, 
Don't assume that they know which Wednesday you're talking about, which date you're talking about, what time you're talking about. Always include time zones, always include locations. And it seems super redundant, but it reduces the number of questions you're going to get. So for instance, I've had this happen where a CEO got an email and it said, hey, I need, um, I need your questionnaire for the board meeting that you're gonna be in the next Wednesday. He was in three board meetings on that Wednesday. He had no idea what questionnaire it was referring to, which company the board meeting was for. And so it took an exchange of emails and a lot of extra time hunting down the files and all that sort of stuff. Whereas if the person was just super clear at the beginning, we found out that the questionnaire was sitting on his desktop. You know, it, it was just a complete waste of time and it's a headache and it's a frustration for everybody involved. So in that first paragraph, provide all of the information, quick snippet, super fast. The next sentence after that is what you need them to do. Whether it is, please review and answer the, qu the questions at the bottom, or please review and provide your signature by such and such date, you know, whatever your action item may be. Be super concise in the body of what you need. Use bullet points, please. Um, use different colors to make due dates stand out. I usually stray away from red because most people have like PTSD from seeing it on bad grades in school. So I usually, usually use colors like orange or green or blue, something that makes the color stand out but isn't super aggressive. Um, and then at the bottom, again, repeat what people need to do. After reviewing the above, please sign the document and return to me by such and such date. After re reviewing the above, please send back your meal preferences for the dinner on Tuesday, April 13th, blah, blah, blah. Um, this will make sure that it's at the top, it's at the bottom, anybody who's skimming is gonna see it twice. And this also provides you a leg to stand on when you're like, I literally asked you twice. <laughs> um, and of course, don't forget to sign off um, and always, always, always include a signature. If you don't have a signature on your email right now, go add it after we get done here. The reason for that is because I shouldn't have to hunt down how to contact you. It should be on your initial emails and it should be on your replies, whether it's your phone number, your email address, what have you. You need to tell people how to get a hold of you without hunting that information down. So I always, at a minimum, include your phone number and your email address. Okay. That's emails. <laughs> um, again, also always remember to attach things, double check it. The great thing is a lot of the email systems now alert you when you've said the word attachment and they're like, where is it? Um, which has saved a lot of us um, big headaches. The next trick is um, a tip that I learned while working with a global team. We had 3000 people in our team and could you imagine sending an email and somebody hitting reply all? and then reply all, and then reply all. <laughs> it was madness. So the tip that I not only used, but I shared out with everyone extensively and said, please, 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 please do this, is put all of the email addresses in the BCC. So use the distribution lists, the emails, or what have you. In the body of the email, whether it needs to be at the top or towards the bottom, you can say, this email has been sent to the following distribution list, or this email has been sent to everyone on the team, or this email has been sent to all company members. And you can make it gray and italicized so it doesn't stand out as much and doesn't read as like part of the message. But what it will do then is if anybody tries to reply all, it goes nowhere. It, go, it comes back to you, you get the reply. And so this is really helpful if you are sending out information and you want people to be able to ask questions or reach back out to you, but you don't want it going to everyone. I would do this with everything. Um, if it's a birthday message, this is a great tip too. If it is a birthday message or an anniversary celebration, or you want people to direct their questions to a leadership team that is working on a project, put them in the two line. So when somebody hits reply all or reply, it goes back to the designated people who are meant to see it. Um, otherwise, everybody else goes in the BCC. But you have to call out who gets sent to because then you, you create a forwarding problem if you don't call out who it was sent to. Otherwise, everybody just forwards, 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 and you're like, I've already got, received this 15 times. I even got the original email, but thank you. So call out who it's sent to. Um, this will save you from the reply all tsunami. This actually happened um, in my company 
with an email that went to 3000 people. And I'm pretty sure we broke the server that day because people were hitting reply all so much that it crashed the server. So save everybody the headache. And my last tip is to use hyperlinks effectively. So in your inbox, you can, or sorry, not in your inbox, in an email, you can insert links. We all know this. You can insert a hyperlink to a website. You can also hyperlink an email address. And if you've ever typed an email, you know that it does it, right? You can say like jlawrence at company.com. Um, and it gives you a nice little hyperlink. People can click on that and a nice little email window pops up and that's great. Um, the unfortunate thing about that is when people do that and they get to their little email window, they just launch into their message, right? You've asked them to reply to Jen for your, you know, feedback on the agenda for yada, yada, yada. Let's, let's use that scenario. Somebody has sent out a meeting agenda and they say, if you have any questions or concerns or edits, please email Jen at jlawrence at company.com um, with your feedback. And so somebody sees the email, they click that nice little email window pops up. They start tapping away. I've got lots of feedback. Tap, 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 send. They likely did not put in a subject line. So I have no idea what they're talking about. None. So a really effective way to do this to save everybody headaches is when you want them to reply to a certain email address. When you do that link, you can actually change the hyperlink. So whether you're using Gmail, Outlook, Yahoo, any email client, you can right click on it, edit the link. And if you designate it as an email, you'll see mail to colon the email address. And there is an option for change subject line or message starter. And you can type in there for them. Re meeting, you know, Tuesday, April 15th meeting agenda feedback. So anybody who chooses to cl click on that rather than reply or forward the original email now will have a pre-formulated subject line that they don't have to provide context to the person on the receiving end. This is a great extra step for customer service that saves everybody a bunch of headaches. This is also super helpful if you put hyperlinks on web pages or in digital documents that you're sending out, like PDFs that have it, you can actually change that email subject line so that they know what it's referencing back to. I work with a client who has me do all of their event planning for them. And on the landing pages, it calls out, if you have any questions, please email so-and-so. And so all of those, um, please email so-and-so and their email address, I've changed it so that the subject actually says, this is pertaining to this meeting. Because at any given time, we're planning between ten, five and 10 meetings. And so if they're like, hey, I'm you know, I'd this is feedback about the meeting or hey, where am I supposed to go? Or do you have the agenda yet? Or yada, yada, yada. Then we have to do the emails back and forth about what meeting are you talking about? Um, because a lot of people are attending multiple meetings. There's a lot of overlap. So to eliminate confusion, one, use subject lines. To make it as easy as possible for everyone involved. It takes minimal effort. I promise you this sounds like a lot, but once you get into the habit of it, it's second nature and you'll never mess that up again. My last little tidbit that I'm going to put in here that I didn't actually write down, um, but I've seen this a lot happening as we've moved into the digital environment. Um, and I'm, I'm a pretty big stickler for it is always call out the time zone. <laughs> Don't ever assume that someone is in the same time zone as you. Um, this, uh, this is so much back and forth that is so unnecessary. I have a video on my YouTube and on my Instagram about that explains different time zones and when to use the daylight and when to use the save or the, um, saving time. <laughs> Sorry. Somehow that fell in my head. The daylight and the saving time. Um, it also explains what the heck happens in Arizona. So if you're really confused about what we're doing down here in Arizona, I will answer that for you. But it also helps you understand that when you should be using those, those uh, different designations. But my one tip to you is when in doubt, leave the D or the S out. Just put Eastern ETPTCT -E um, and just make sure you understand that you're communicating that way. If you will want to do that white glove service and take it one step forward, always put things in the time zone of the person on the receiving end. Um, that is not necessary, but that does eliminate a lot of confusion because people will look at a time, they won't register the time zone. They'll say, yeah, I'm available at one o'clock. And in reality, that's one o'clock Pacific time, not Eastern time, which happens to be much earlier 
uh, Pacific time. So that being said, last section. So effective meetings, time zones, <laughs> be hyper aware of time zones, um, especially if you're working with a global team. Um, if you're working with a, basically a U.S. landlocked team, it's not as uh, difficult, especially during the, the, the fall and winter when we're only two hours apart from the East Coast to the West Coast. But um, if you're working with a global team or people who are traveling overseas, do your best to be hyper aware of time zones. And if you have recurring meetings with teams that are overseas, make sure that you're, you're playing fair and try to adjust the time zones so that they're always, you know, maybe one team, the US based team meets late one week or one month, and then the next month you slip off. Um, I worked with a team in Dublin, and this was a bit, this was a big pain for them because there's a significant difference between Dublin and Phoenix. And so we had to figure out how to balance the time zone. But this also counts for anybody who's doing East Coast to West Coast. Don't make the West Coast meet at six o'clock AM all the time. I guarantee you, you can find time somewhere else. So do your best to be hyper aware of time zones and play fair. Um, especially in the digital environment, make sure you send agendas ahead of time. You should always be sending agendas ahead of time, always. Um, but in a digital environment, it's really easy to misinterpret what a meeting is for because you're not feeling the energy of the office. You're not feeling the energy of a leader. So if you are a leader and you send out a meeting invite to one of your uh, team members and you're like, meeting, <laughs> and they have no idea what it's about, you know the spiral. They are suddenly down the rabbit hole. I'm getting fired. I'm losing my job. It's the end of the world. <laughs> so eliminate any questions by making sure you're clear in your invites, but also that you're sending an agenda ahead of time. Like, hey, I want to touch on X, Y, and Z. The other thing that that does is it, it increase, increases engaged attention. Um, we actually had a problem at one of the companies I worked with where we would have meetings and we wouldn't express the agenda ahead of time and people would just not show up because the assumption was it's a waste of my time. I don't even know what we're meeting about. And it's, you know, that's a crummy attitude to have, have, but it happens and people can come up with all the excuses in the world. Sorry, it's at the time of my doctor's appointment or I'm sorry, I wasn't feeling well because they simply just think your meeting's a waste of time. So go ahead and provide just a few bullet points on what it is, put it right in the meeting invite, update the meeting invite, but don't update it too many times. Nobody likes getting that invite 15 times because you're changing things around. So once the, the agenda is set, that's when you update the invite. Um, but make sure people know what to expect. Um, it really helps eliminate a lot of the like chatter and the insecurity and the uh, worry that happens with having meetings. And it also helps people come in with questions in mind. They already know what to expect. They're much more engaged because they know what's coming. Um, so there's a lot to be said for agendas. I don't want to beat a dead horse, but this is definitely something that if you aren't doing, start doing it even on a really, really small task. I have a client that I meet with every week and every week we just do a real quick, she's super clever. She calls it the agenda. Um, but we just do just a few bullet points. And I mean, we spend half the phone call just catching up and chatting anyways, but we've already outlined what we want to cover. Um, and it's just the two of us, you know, we're not, we're not trying to answer for 20 people and set expectations, but it's really helpful to know what needs to get covered. Um, the next part is to work on engaging all team members. And this is something that I encourage you to practice in all of your digital meetings, especially if you have more than a one-on-one -on -one connection. Um, we've all seen it in the work environment that there are employees who are quieter than others. They come into the conference room, they are um, quiet, they sit back, maybe they're thinkers um, they, or they're shy, they um, are insecure about the topic you're talking about, whatever it may be. Um, there are simple techniques that you can use to make sure that everybody has a voice. And it's really important to use these techniques, especially if and I say if, but you know you have them, the team members who are super powerful voices, whether they are railroaders by nature, um, they're just loud and opinionated, um, or they just like to talk, um, that's usually me in a meeting, um, or they get super excited about ideas and they just run over everybody else. Um, so it's really important to use these techniques. So there's two ways to do it. Um, one is to create a roundtable check-in habit. So if you're doing a team meeting, this is where it works best. 
as you say, okay, we're going to go through the agenda. We're going to talk about X, Y, and Z. I'm going to cover this, you know, to trickle down from the leaders and all that sort of stuff. And then we're going to go through all the team members in alphabetical order. If you have something that you need to talk to the team about, go ahead. If you don't have anything to talk about, when I get to you, just say pass. And this makes sure that nobody monopolizes the entire meeting. Um, and it allows everybody to have a voice at some point during the meeting. The other thing that you can do is practice call outs and it can be done very gently. Um, I've had to use this a few times in a meeting and, and there's a way to do it really well where you can say, hey, you know, uh, Peggy, I haven't heard from you uh, on, the, on this. What do you think? Or, hey, Samantha, this is your area of expertise. Do you have any feedback for us on this? Um, and it's a really good way to rope people in and make sure that they are having the opportunity to voice their opinion. And you're basically handing over the floor. And you don't have to do this as a leader. You don't have to be the host of the meeting. You don't have to be the person in charge. You don't have to be the person running the agenda. If you notice that one of your coworkers isn't getting the opportunity to share their knowledge or their opinion, or they haven't said anything and you know they have something to say and you're gonna be that friend, you can just simply give them a quick call out that says, hey Andy, um, we were just talking about this the other day. Do you care to share your thoughts? Because I'm pretty upset about it. Are you upset about it? And so you can give them that opportunity. They may get pissed off at you, but hey, you know what? At least they got to say their thing. But there is a way to do it gently to make sure that every team member has a voice in a meeting. And this is super important to do in a digital environment. Again, this is a great skill to have as you go back to a traditional workplace. But in a digital environment, this is wildly important because otherwise people are talking over each other over and over and over and over again. Also, while you're in the meeting, um, I didn't put this on the slide because I, it's one of those things that I thought was common sense. And then I realized that I've been very blessed to work with digital, uh, communications. And now you're seeing memes about it everywhere. <laughs> Encourage people to use the mute button. Say, we want to reduce the amount of background noise as much as possible. We want you to stay engaged. So let's just practice turning on and off the mute button. It's super annoying when people have all sorts of noise coming in the background and it's going over the speakers and nobody can listen, hear anybody. And then, you know, we've all been on the conference call, right? Can somebody mute the phone? Mute their phone. Who is that making noise? It's so disruptive. So as a best practice with your team, even just get into the habit when you're on one-on-one, -on -one, say, I'm just going to practice using my mute button finger, right? So I, when I'm not speaking, I'm just going to go ahead and hit mute. So I just get used to reducing the background noise and I can hear you better. Um, so as you're working on this with your team, again, this is a great way to be leaders within an organization because there's a ripple effect that happens. And so you start with your team members and say, we're going to practice using our mute buttons. And then as you go to other meetings, try using your mute buttons in there and just exemplifying the proper way to communicate on a digital call. And finally, don't skip this last step, no matter what the meeting is, whether it's a one-on-one, -on -one, whether it's a team meeting, whether it's a big meeting, whether you are the note taker, whether you're in charge or not, send a follow-up email with your understanding of recaps and action items. So if you've met with your manager, tell them, I'm gonna send you a quick email that recaps my understanding of the takeaways. Um, please let me know if I missed something. Or if you were in a meeting and you got assigned a bunch of stuff, send an email to the team and say, this is my understanding of the takeaways from the meeting. If I missed something or you understood something different, please let me know and we'll clear that up. This helps keeping communication going in a way that is super effective and clear because somebody's not gonna come back and say, hey, we had that call last week and you missed X, Y, and Z. You can say, no, because I sent the recap email and I sent it to the team and I said, this is my understanding of what my responsibility is. Or I sent a list of everything that people committed to and that's actually this person's. So go ahead and just get into the habit, build that habit with your team of sending recap emails. Again, something that should be done in a traditional work environment, but it's so much easier to be like, hey, you got it, you got it, you got it, everybody's good, everybody's good, check in with me later if you, don't have, any, if you have any questions. Um, but with a digital environment, that being able to read the room and make sure everybody understands what's expected and make sure everybody understands what's needed is really difficult. So by sending a recap email with the action items, you're eliminating any fogginess around what's needed. So 
that's my final thing. Um, in my first um, session, I covered fostering relationships. And in there, I go a little bit more in depth on what you can do in one-on-one -on -one meetings. And there are some great communication tips in there. So if you haven't seen that one yet, I suggest you go and check it out. It's still, the replay is still up on my website at jenlawrence.co slash webinars. So at this time, I'm gonna ask, does anyone have any questions? Any questions from Illinois, Kentucky, Oregon, Washington, Indiana? Man, you guys are everywhere today. All right. So I don't see any questions coming in, which is great because either I did my job really well or I did my job really poorly. <laughs> um, so that being said, if you want more from me, you can visit genlaw.co slash sign up. Um, that is my, my very fancy bit.ly link that will give you my top 10 productivity tips for free. These are tips that over the course of my 15 plus years that I've, I have narrowed down to being like, this is why I'm so organized and so efficient. I'm just giving it to you for free. All right. And if you decide that you or your team need more, if you are stuck, um, I have coached many, many, many teams. Um, I am also incredibly passionate about teaching, uh, coaching admins. So if you have an admin team that is struggling with these things, or you are as a leader are struggling, just contact me. Um, we'll do a free 15 minute consultation and talk and see how I can help you. It may result in just some free resources that I already have available, or we can discuss if more in depth coaching is needed. Happy to have that conversation with you. You see the link there, just go to jenlawrence.co slash contact or reach out to me on LinkedIn. You can reach out to me on Facebook, Instagram. <laughs> I'm pretty much everywhere. I'm a millennial. I'm an older millennial, but I'm a millennial. Um, so I have it all. Um, but I would love, love, love for you guys to get in touch with me and stay in touch. I thank you very much. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you, Anne, for your feedback. I'm more than happy to share these tips with you. Um, and if you would like any more information on this, would like additional training for your team, let's have a conversation until then stay healthy, communicate well with your teams, and I will be sending out the replay to you. Have a great day, guys.